All right. Well, welcome back again for another uh, session on our continuing lectures for the liturgy. Last week, we ended with the gospel, and so for our lecture this evening, we will begin with the creed. Uh, in the Mass, the creed is recited uh, only on special feast days and, of course, on Sundays. And we know, for most people, who are familiar with two forms of the creed. There are other versions of the creed, Athanasian Creed, but the ones that most people are familiar with is the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And in the Mass, on Sundays and on feast days, the Nicene Creed is the one that is recited. It is called the Nicene because it was first formulated at the First Council of Nicaea in the year 325. And the Council of Nicaea was the first general council in the history of the Church since the Council of Jerusalem, uh, which was held, obviously, in Jerusalem. Um, the uh, apostles were present, Peter and Paul, and the primary objection, uh, uh, object of the Council of Jerusalem was trying to um, figure out the idea that if one was uncircumcised, could you, uh, did you need to be circumcised first, etc. So that was all determined. That was the first council in the church. Then the major, second major one that came up was in Nicaea. And it was in this council that the church had taken her first great step to define doctrine more precisely in, rest- in response to a challenge from a heretical theology, primarily the Arians. And so the Council of Nicaea formulated the, uh, Nicaea, the Nicaean Creed um, to give to us an idea, uh, well, the dogma of our faith, that Christ um, is true God and true man, uh, and that he is that the same substance of the Father, co-eternal with him. Um, Arius had the idea that the Son, the second person, the Trinity, was not of the same substance, and if we believed, if well, if that was to be believed, then it meant that uh, at some point in time that the second person, the Trinity, had a beginning. And so the creed, after it's recited, marks the end of the Mass of the Catechumens. And from that, the priest will then kiss the altar, He'll turn around, face the congregation, and greet them again with Dominus Fubiscum, Ecum Spiritu Tuo, face the altar, and uh, say aloud, Oremus, um, inviting everyone present to pray with him, and then he'll go into the offertory, and he'll begin the offertory antiphon. And St. Augustine, in some of his readings, tells us that in his day, the people at the offertory sang hymns from the book of Psalms. And this hymn was called the Offertory. And while these verses were sung, the faithful would bring up to the altar their various gifts of bread, wine, flowers, or gold. And all these, um, all these items were going to be used uh, within the sanctuary uh, for the celebration, the further celebration of the Mass. Prime, and obviously the most important was the presentation of the bread and the wine. And yet with this visible gift, St. Augustine tells us that the person who brought the visible gift and all who were present at the Mass also brought with them an invisible one, the gift of his will to be always ready for sacrifice. And of course, in our own day, we no longer do this, but our disposition of sacrifice is always possible and necessary for each of us if we are to follow, follow the Lord and accept our crosses each day. And so, of course, that... Um, was replaced, it, that, that, that presentation at the offertory, as St. Augustine describes, is, is replaced now by our own um, modern, well, modern, but the, uh, the collection. You know, when people would present um, and offer their gifts of money for the further support of the church, and especially the purchases of various items that are used at the Mass, the bread, the wine, the candles, flowers to decorate the altar, the upkeep of the church, and also to assist in in uh, some kind of stipend for the support of of the parish priest. So after <clears throat> after the priest uh, recites the antiphon uh, for the offertory, he then begins with the uh, first prayer of the offertory, uh, in which he offers the host upon the patent. And the, the priest recites that prayer, which goes as follows, as you, you all will know from following in your missal. Receive, O Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, this spotless host which I, thy unworthy servant, do offer unto thee, my living and true God, for my own countless sins, offenses, and negligences, and for all here present, 
so also for all the faithful Christians, living or dead, that it may avail for my own aid and for their salvation unto life eternal. Amen. And the priest then presents this offering of the host to God, and he calls it a spotless host, not because the host itself is white and clean and prepared with great care of the finest wheat, but because that host will become the true and innocent and spotless victim, our Lord Jesus Christ. And also the priest prays that in virtue of this host which is being offered, that God in his mercy will forgive the priest and all those present their sins, and to beg that the sacrifice will be not only of their benefit, but also for the dead, obviously for the souls in purgatory. So reminding us of the presence that the Mass is offered not only for the living, but also for the dead. It's encompassing, the again, the, the, the whole idea of the Church, not only those present on earth, but those in heaven and those in purgatory, the Church uh, triumphant, the Church militant, and the Church suffering. And you'll also notice in the offertory prayer of the host, the priest lists three categories of sins. He just doesn't say sin, but he actually is very specific in the three categories of sin of which each of us are prone and for each of us probably have failed at one time in our lives or maybe many times in which we have offended God. So he lists those three categories of sins, peccatis, offensionibus, and negligencies. Uh, Peccati sins of commission, obviously willful thoughts, uh, words, um, deeds. Offensionibus sins of scandal, uh, times that we have been uh, disad- we have given disedification, bad example to our neighbor through our conduct, through our lack of faith ourselves, and maybe even leading people into sin. And then the third, negligencies, sins of omission, neglected duties of zeal and charity, first to God and then to our neighbor. And after offering the host, the priest will then walk to the epistle side of the altar, wipe the chalice with the purificator to make sure it's clean. He'll then receive the wine, pour some into the chalice, and then the priest will take the crude of water, and he'll bless the water first, and then he'll pour a drop of water into the wine. And the priest blesses that water, uh, not, not for the water itself, but the blessing of the water is actually um, for the benefit of the entire church, uh, especially those present at the Mass. Uh, if we'll read that prayer that the, the priest recites when he blesses the water. O God, who in creating human nature does wonderfully dignify it and still more wonderfully restore it, grant that by the mystery of this water and wine we may be partakers of his divine nature, who vouchsafe to be made partaker of our, of our human nature, even Jesus Christ, our Son, thy Lord. And this mixing of the water and the wine is called the mingling of the wine and water, and this recalls the unity of the divine person and the human nature of Jesus Christ. And the water is representative of humanity, that we are each to be partakers of the divine nature of Jesus by the possession of the divine life in us, primarily sanctifying grace. So when the priest blesses the water, it's not the water itself, but he's actually blessing all who are present at the Mass so that, again, we further benefit from that blessing for our own uh, further increase in grace and our sanctification. And the water is blessed by the priest so that we may each benefit by the grace of that blessing. And since all of us as sinful humanity are always in need of blessings as another source of his grace. And it was Pope Alexander I in the second century who ordered that the water be mixed with the wine of the offertory, and also remembering, recalling, that water issued forth from the heart of Christ at the piercing of his chest by the soldier Longinus. And St. Gertrude the Great also had a wonderful uh, devotion in which she recalls in some of her writings. And St. Gertrude the Great said that during the offering, offering of the wine that she would place her heart in the chalice, and she prayed that the words of the offertory, as they are pr- pray- prayed for the wine, would also be prayed over her heart. And just as the water and wine would be changed into the precious blood of Jesus, so also her heart would be changed from one cold and lukewarm into a heart burning with an ardent love of God and of neighbor. And I think that's a wonderful reminder of our own devotion to the Mass, especially at that time that the offering of the chalice, uh, the, the wine and the water, and also the offering of the host 
um, should remind us that we, at that time we should be offering our lives to God as the priest offers the host that we place our lives, all our disappointments, all our cares, our vocation, um, all our our, our disappointments, our heartache, and we place all of these things upon the upon the paten. So that as the priest offers the host, we also offer our lives to God, that we are always going to be ready in sacrifice, that we want to prepare our hearts and our souls, especially at that time, for our uh, reception of communion at Mass, but that we're always recept- receptive to the grace of God. And as the um, priest offers the wine and water uh, in the chalice, so also we take the example of St. Gertrude the Great, that we also place in the chalice our own lives, you know, our own desire to love God more, to love Him as much as we can and certainly as much as He wants us to. And as St. Gertrude said, that our hearts will go from one from cold and lukewarm into a heart burning with an ardent love of God and of neighbor. Then the priest will incline to the altar, he'll bow low, he'll then recite two prayers uh, from Psalm 50, uh, that a humble and contrite heart, that he will offer, be worthy to offer this sacrifice to God, that he will receive, that God will receive the humble and contrite heart from the priest, not only his, but the hearts of all here present. And then a second prayer, asking the Holy Ghost to bless and make worthy the offering that is given to the Father for the sacrifice of His Son at the consecration of the Mass. The priest will then return to the epistle side of the Gospel, and he'll begin what's called the lavabo. And lavabo is a Latin word, lavo, meaning to wash off, to bathe, or to clean. And the lavabo is symbolic of purity and, again, our need for forgiveness of sins. And that our constant need to be made worthy before God as we're invited by Him each day to renew the gift of our participation in His divine life. And the lavabo, as the priest is washing his fingers, and you'll notice it's always uh, the two fingers, the thumb and the forefinger, never the, you know, the entire hands, but only those fingers are washed uh, because it is those fingers that will touch the body of Christ at the consecration of the Mass. So to make sure that they are further purified and cleansed, to be made worthy to touch the body of our Lord. And as the priest washes those fingers, he recites Psalm 25. I will wash my hands amongst the innocent, and I will encompass thine altar, O Lord, that I may hear the voice of praise and tell of all thy wondrous works. And it's a great reminder um, for us of the importance of those fingers that the priest uses when he is consecrating um, the host and obviously the wine, but those fingers that touch the body of our Lord. Even if you, you always notice that after the consecration, he keeps those fingers close together to ensure that even small particles that may remain on, on his fingers and on his thumb are not desecrated. You know, that, they are, that the devotion of the priest further continues even after the consecration to make sure that nothing is defiled and also to keep those particles. And there's that wonderful story of St. Isaac Jogue when he was a missionary uh, in, in, uh, here in this country. And uh, one of the, when he was offering Mass in the early days when he arrived, um, the Indians who would watch from afar noticed that when he offered Mass, that there was something very special about those fingers because he kept them together for a long time. And they seemed to be rather fascinated by that, and they obviously got the idea there was something very special and very important about that. And a part of his sufferings, a part of his tortures, is that the Indians, and I, I believe from what I read, even the Indian children would spend their time and they would chew and they would gnaw away at those fingers. And after St. Isaac Joe escaped and returned to France, you know, obviously, people had seen what what horrible sufferings he had gone through. That the uh, thumb and the forefinger had been gnawed down, and so, and there's uh, what we call um, in I don't know in canon law now if it's actually there, but uh, but at one time, if a priest did not have those fingers, if he lost them through an accident, or if he was, you know, if he had a birth defect, he could never offer mass. He could not be ordained because he had to have what was called the canonical digits those fingers were necessary uh, in the celebration of Mass. And St. Isaac Jogue was given a special dispensation by the Pope of the time that he could offer Mass uh, despite not having those fingers they, because they had been gnawed down. And someone had actually made, out of gold, 
um, these little, I guess you could call them obviously fingers, um, and every time St. Isaac would offer Mass, he would slip those on to replace the fingers that weren't there so that he could celebrate Mass. That was a special privilege, a dispensation that was given to him by the Pope. And then, of course, he returned to, uh, to North America and eventually suffered um, his own martyrdom. But that's a beautiful story, the importance of those fingers, you know, how... What a wonderful devotion it is of the priest, and certainly for all of us, again, to have a great reverence and respect for the Eucharist, even in the smallest of particles. And obviously, the lavabo is also symbolic of the washing of the feet of our Lord, uh, the, feeding, the washing of the feet by Christ, and also the washing of the hands of Pilate after he sentenced Jesus to death upon the cross. Then the priest will return to the altar, to the middle of the altar, and then he'll recite uh, what's called the sushipe, the prayer in which the priest asks the Trinity to now receive these offerings in honor of the sufferings and the passion, the ascension of our Lord, and also in honor of Our Lady and of all the saints. Now I'll recite that prayer. Receive, O Holy Trinity, this oblation, which we make to thee in memory of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, that it may avail unto their honor and our salvation, and may they vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we celebrate on earth through Christ our Lord. Amen. And St. John Chrysostom made a very good observation regarding the practice of recognizing and offering that sacrifice in honor of the saints. And he said that when a public ovation is offered to a king, the officers who have shared with him the perils of war and have borne themselves valiantly are also mentioned by name that they may likewise share in the glory of his triumph. And so it is with the saints. They are honored and glorified in the presence of their Lord when His passion and death are triumphantly represented in the Holy Mass. They, too, receive special mention, and the heroic deeds they achieved against their foes are praised and magnified. The glory is given to Almighty God for the might wherewith He fortified them in the strife, for the grace by means of which He secured to them the final victory. And again, it reminds us of the importance of the intercession of the saints, that even after their death, their interest in us has not stopped, but certainly continues on, even more so because they also were human. They had their struggles, their sins, their, probably their failures when they did not cooperate with grace, and also the many wonderful works and accomplishments, especially in their own sanctification, that they were able to achieve by their cooperation with God's grace. And so we remember that, and how now their interest in us and for us is all the greater because they saw, obviously, they know their own struggles that they had, but they see again our own struggles and how very much we need their example and their intercession before God and their prayers for us that we also may achieve what they have done and we may save our souls too. Now we, remember, now we know that the offertory is done in silence, uh, which includes the prayer following the secret. And this silence is a further recollection of our Lord as he hung upon the cross. And the scripture tells us that only seven times did he speak publicly, and the remainder was spent in silence as Christ shed his blood for our salvation. So also the church is reflective of that the necessity of that silence so that we may enter more into that mystery but also avail and dispose ourselves more of that grace so that we're not distracted by our neighbor but that our focus is all where it should be. And again, as I said last week, uh, when we go to church, when we enter into the, ch into the church, when we go into our pew, what is our mindset? What are we thinking about? I gotta, can't wait till this is over, then I can go and get home and do what I really want to do. Or do we really avail ourselves of the grace that is available through that sacrifice? Do we really sit there and remember or sort of meditate upon the holy women, St. John, Our Lady, anyone else who is present on Calvary? You know, what were they doing? They were watching our Lord being crucified. They were watching him hanging on the cross. And they were certainly hoping for an end to this soon. But obviously availing themselves of the idea of what will come from this afterwards. And so what is our own idea? And what is also our own mindset 
when we are in church and we are, are we reflective sufficiently that we really understand and believe that this is also a representation of Calvary and that truly the sacrifice of our Lord is to begin again in an unbloody manner, but truly what's happening up there also happened in Calvary in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So following the offertory, the priest will then kiss the altar. He turns around to face the congregation. And at this point, the priest then says, Orate fratres, pray, brethren, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be worthy, may be worthily accepted to God the Father Almighty. So, and also, and you'll you'll notice that again, the priest distinguishes my sacrifice and yours, not our sacrifice. He's distinguishing his own role, his own participation, and also yours. But in a sense, we're all in this together. But there is a distinction between the two. So, my sacrifice and yours. You know, there's the history, I think it's a very be- wonderful history of understanding why does the priest make a complete circle? You know, if you notice, whenever the priest greets the congregation, he'll face them in St. Dominus Fubiscum, and then he'll, the way he turns, I'll do it this way. So obviously facing the altar, he turns this way, Dominus Fubiscum, Ecum Spiritu Tuo, and he returns the same way, whereas with the offertory, Orate Fratres, he then turns around, and makes a complete circle. And from the research that I had done, uh, interesting point that in the early church, uh, in the cathedrals, you know, when the bishop would offer mass, they would have what was called the canons. You know, all the canons were present in the sanctuary. The canons were the, I suppose you could say, um, the monks. You know, the monks of the of the various chapters of uh, different cathedrals all throughout Europe. And they were the ones who sang the offices, the hours of the office, all throughout the day. And so the, and, and some of the ancient um, cathedrals in Europe, obviously in Rome, they all have different canons. And it was those canons who would be present. And then, of course, the people were around, you know, in, their, you know, in, in the nave and all around. So he was sort of reminding everyone, the entire church, so circling around and making sure he covered everyone in a sense, to make sure that they were all included and they were all being reminded that you are here now to witness and to uh, see our Lord again offered in sacrifice, but that we are all to pray together so that we're made more worthy, but also receive more and increase of that sanctifying grace. So, you know, by that complete circle. And I suppose also you could say that he's encompassing the entire universal church because even though um, when a priest offers... A mass with no one present, no server, no congregation, you know, we call that, we refer to that as a private mass. But can we really say it's a private mass in a sense? Because it really is public. Because the intention is always for the entire church, whether faith or present or not. And I think in some ways we've gotten away from that, unfortunately, with the idea that if no congregation is present, the priest shouldn't be offering mass or something ridiculous like that. But anyways, that, that's sort of this current idea. But really, is there such a thing as a, pu- a private Mass? No, there isn't. Even when the priest gives the blessing to the... And I've obviously done this many times. He doesn't just sort of skip the blessing. Oh, no one's here. I'm not going to give a blessing. He does it exactly as if the church was full. Because then that blessing is for those present. But again, it is for the entire universal church. For the benefit and salvation of all, of all mankind. You know, so even I remember listening to a, a priest do a talk on the liturgy, and he's the chaplain for a convent of Carmelites in Nebraska, and he also made that same point. You know, when I'm, because the, often their own um, where they where they seat is always off to the side, just on the side of the sanctuary. They're not in front of the priest or with the congregation, but they're off to the side. And he said, you know, when I give you a blessing, do I face you on the side? and give you a blessing at the end of Mass, he said, no, I don't. I just turn and face out to the entire congregation and give the blessing. Because he said, remember, this Mass isn't just for you, but it's for the entire church. So that's reflective. You know, so the church is for the ben- uh, the the mass is for the benefit, whether it's pri- recited privately or publicly, it is always for the benefit of the entire church and obviously the whole world. And so the priest, when he turns around and does a complete circle, it's reflective of that, that everyone's included, we're all in this together, and we're all here for our benefit, but obviously for those four great ends. As I said before, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. 
And so we then petition God by the secret, the prayer that follows after the response uh, following the Rarate Fratres, and it's called the secret. And it's called the secret because the prayer is said quietly, that the priest is now petitioning on his behalf in the entire church, um, that we are now going to benefit from this offering, and that this offering will be pleasing and, and pleasing to God, so that it will then be worthy of, for the consecration, for the sacrifice of our Lord, and obviously on our behalf. And it is during the secret that the petition follows by asking God that this oblation will be worthily offered. We ask for those graces we wish to obtain as the fruits of the Mass that will be offered. And then finally, uh, f- following the secret, we then go into the preface. And that preface is the, the prayer, uh, sometimes lengthy, but rather beautiful, because uh, the preface is called that because it's going, we're getting closer now. You know, we're getting closer to the sacrifice of our Lord, so it's called the preface because it's just before the canon, which is that prayer in which we're now going to especially petition God for the church, for the living, for the dead, and then, of course, prepare for the consecration by the words of institution, the words of our Lord that the priest will recite to consecrate the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. And the preface is a hymn of praise and thanksgiving. St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century commented that during the preface, what should be our mindset? What preparation are we making for ourselves? And he says that our hearts should be turned heavenward to God and not downward to earth and all our worldly affairs. It is as if the priest in this hour commands us to forget all the cares of this life, all domestic griefs, and to raise our hearts to the good God in heaven. And so that preface, if you read it over some time, is a prayer of praise. You know, it is fitting and just, Lord, that you have called us to be here. Uh, you know, we honor this saint. We are here for whatever, you know, whatever the preface would be. Give the honor to the Trinity that we may benefit from this, that we may be pleasing to you, and therefore in the end to save our souls. And then, of course, the preface concludes with the Sanctus. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. You know, the, the, the Sanctus is that joyful cry that we make to heaven in the anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ. And that same quote is used by the Israelites when Christ entered into, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. As the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11 tells us, the crowds that went before him and those that followed kept crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the church borrows that from Scripture, that just as Christ entered triumphantly into Jerusalem with all the crowds around him, anticipating a wonderful thing, so also we are reminded that Christ is about to come to us, so we also rejoice and say, Holy, Holy, Holy. You know, the, the Lord is about to come. He is going to be present amongst us again. All right. Let's, br- and then let's uh, have a break for about five minutes, and then we'll come back with questions, and then we'll conclude at 8, eight o'clock. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's continue here. Any, any questions? Any questions, complaints, compliments? Yeah, I guess they could be. Yeah, that the the blood and water running from his side. Yeah, it could be a symbol of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what I mentioned. That's um, also in the um, in the apparitions of the Divine Mercy. Our Lord also says that too. That the water represented obviously it was his blood. You know, the salvation, the means of our salvation, but also the water represented humanity. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, nothing's ever been, I mean, sure there are commentaries from church fathers about that, but anything really official, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know. John? Uh, the host is made out of it's, uh, uh, no, is it some way to hold matzah? Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. <clears throat> yeah, un- I, I guess it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it is. But unleavened bread, yeah, with no yeast. Obviously, remembrance, that's what the Jews use when they escape from 
uh, from the Egyptians. They didn't have time to allow the bread to, to leaven, to rise, so they just went on their way. And so whenever they, the Jews celebrated that feast, and of course it was during that time that our Lord, you know, the, the Last Supper occurred. And so the church used what our Lord used at the time. Unleavened bread. Even though I think in some of the Eastern churches, they were permitted to use leavened bread. That was an abuse, but I think over time, because they'd gotten used to using it, they were given a dispensation to use it. But if we were to use it, it would be an invalid mass. And, and, and anything else in the ingredients, there was a controversy. I remember 25 years ago uh, when we got into this idea of families baking the bread for mass. They would bring it up and present it, and that's what the, what the priest would use. Uh, but somehow we got into this idea, well, oh, let's just use, a, you know, let's use some honey. Let's use, you know, to sweeten it up a little bit or, yeah, or anything. All these ingredients that were included made it the matter invalid. Therefore, those masses were invalid. There was a, I can't remember how long ago, 10, 15 years ago, um, I think it was Belmont Abbey uh, in North Carolina or the one in Indianapolis. I can't think of the name of it. I can't remember where it was, but they had been, the priests there had been using, as it was determined later, invalid matter for I don't know how many years, two or three years, and Rome got a whiff of it, found, investigated it, and then found out that this was invalid matter and then ordered the priests to go back, and they had to repeat all those masses over that period of two or three years. So they had to go back and do those masses again for those intentions. That's, that's grave. That's really serious. But Rome ordered them to go back, and they had to repeat all those masses with valid matter um, for all those intentions. Yeah, so that's very serious. I have a question. Isaiah, uh, there's a mass being said, and, and the first the priest dies of a heart attack or murder or something, shot or something. Uh, does that mass have to be finished off from that point on? Yes. Yeah, if a priest was to fall ill or die during the mass, another priest has to come in and continue on. Yeah, the mass is to be continued. Yeah, yeah. What about this uh, private mass? I think the that we, we unite ourselves with all masses said throughout the whole world today. So that that person that the priest that has no uh, movement out there, uh, with the or whatever. Uh, so we're uniting with that. Right. It's all alone. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The universality of the mass. Yeah. Jane. What about the people who attended that mass, going, you know, like for Sunday? Oh, yeah, yeah. For those masses that were offered invalidly, yeah, God would not have judged them. They, that wasn't their fault. It was beyond their control. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. God is not limited. Yeah. Ecclesia suplex, the church supplies that anyways. It would still be an invalid mass. Yeah. Any other questions? Complaints? Oh, Billy. Yes, sir. This will be interesting. Sorry? What kind of grapes are the holy Ooh, good question. What kind of grapes? <laughs> Grape, the grapes that would be, um, would be crushed and the wine would be used, but only at the beginning. Because you know? when, when wine sets, it, it ferments, so it becomes, um, it becomes stronger. And so the church wants to use wine that's in which the grapes are crushed right from the beginning. So the wine is used right away. No additives are added or anything to preserve it or to keep it fresh longer. So it's all, and, and any particular grape, I'm not really sure. That I don't know. There's a certain grape you mean? Yeah, that I don't know. That I'm not sure of. If there's a particular grape or a, a type, yeah, I don't know. Because uh, their wines vary in taste and color. I know that one time in the history of the church, only red wine could be used uh, for fear that white wine being lighter would confuse with the water. And so the server would hand the water. And, so the, and that's happened, too. I, I remember Father uh, Kenneth Baker, who is the editor of Homiletic and Pastoral Review, great magazine uh, in New Jersey. He's a Jesuit. He lives at our parish in, in New Jersey, Pequonic, uh, in residence. But he had said that he had gone to some conference and offered mass, and they had light wine. And he was given the water. And then he realized as he drank it, oh, this is all water. <laughs> so he had to go back and start mass all over again. So there's that danger. There's that danger. Of, of white, and I, I, I've even used light wine, and I had to kind of look, oh, it is wine, we can just smell it, you know, 
but there is always but the church has, has granted that you know that we can use white uh, white wine too now and uh, not only red wine and some red wines are so dark and they stain so easily that it's better to use the white wine I prefer to use the red myself just to make sure yeah yeah and it's yeah the representation of the blood of Christ yeah Joan Yes, yeah, there are only designated people who can, uh, who are approved by the bishops to, um, yeah, to to process and make the Walter wine. I'm with the impression that the, that the Nova Soil got, you know, uh, the Nova Soil Actually, that's true. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, my impression, I could be wrong. I'll, I'll ask about that. I'll, I'll investigate that. So my impression was that only certain places were designated to be able to do, uh, to have the wineries available and, and process and make the wine and then have it because they know that those are the places that are not adding anything or messing around with it. So that's, that's a new one on me. That I didn't know. Most of these wines are by a store of sulfate in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a preser- so we can't use that. Yeah, it, it's a it's an additive. Yeah, yeah. That's why the wine is used soon because as it sits, it ferments, and it could become invalid matter. Yeah. Mary. <laughs> a clever man once said, "It's not the questions I'm afraid of." <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Why do we have two masses? Oh, you mean the Novus Ordo and the Latin Mass? Yeah. Oh, let's not get into that, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> this is an, this is I, as I said, my very first class. Yeah, I know, no, I know, but we're not going to get into that. This is about the Latin Mass and what it all entails, etc. It's not to be a okay. yeah between the traditional and the Novus Ordo. Yeah, it's all a valid Mass. Gives grace. Yes. We'll leave it at that. Okay. It's approved by the Pope. Okay. All right. So now we go from the Sanctus and we now go into the heart of the Mass, if you want to say it, the heart, the canon of the Mass. You know, and the canon of the Mass begins from after the Sanctus until the Our Father. And it's called the canon, coming from the Latin word meaning rule. And this is the heart of the Mass. And in the history of the liturgy, it is the canon of the Mass that is regarded as the oldest part. Even uh, parts of it um, going that back to apostolic times, you know, to the times of the apostles. And it was St. Gregory the Great who formulated it, and he added some things in the canon. And from that time until 19, uh, 1960, I think it was, Pope John XXIII uh, included the name of St. Joseph in the canon. So before that, from what I remember, there were no other changes. So from about like, the 6th century until the 20th century, uh, the canon remained essentially the same. Um, but this is the heart of the Mass. You know, this is where now we prepare ourselves um, as we come closer now to the sacrifice of our Lord at the consecration of the Mass. Um, and the, the canon of the Mass is reflective again of our need for the grace of God. And it is during this time that the, prayer peti- that the Church petitions Almighty God now for certain um, particular intentions and needs. And the, and the Mass begins, and I, the canon of the Mass, and I love the, um, the beginning of it, you know, te igitur clementissime pater per Jesum Christum filium tuum domine nostrum. You know, wherefore, where am I here? Yeah. Wherefore, you know, almighty, heavenly, and eternal God. Let me look at the exact translation so you all have it. Uh, Holy Lord, almighty Father, eternal God. We're not just saying, you know, hey God, up there, you know, we're saying, Holy Father, you know, Almighty God, uh, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Eternal God. We're identifying very clearly who He is, and in our relationship to Him, who is He? You know, He is holy, He is almighty, and He is eternal. And I think that's a great way of starting off that um, essential, that heart, you know, the part of, of the Mass. What a great way to start it off. And it is from there that the first petition of the Mass is for the benefit of the Church. You know, it's during that time that the po- name of the Pope is specifically mentioned, and then the name of the Bishop, who within his diocese 
is the representative of Christ. You know, he is the shepherd. He is our chief shepherd within the diocese. And so we offer specific prayers for his benefit, obviously for the grace and the, um, the need that he has in guiding us and shepherding us uh, along the way, you know, to save our souls. The chief shepherd, the vicar of Christ, and then the local shepherd, the bishop of the diocese. So their names are mentioned specifically, but then in the first petition of the Mass is for the protection, the guidance of the church, for those who teach, defend, and uh, who guide her. You know. So the first petition of the canon is for the benefit of the, of the church, for her continued perseverance, protection, and the salvation of her members. Let's see. After this, after this to God follows a prayer for Holy Church that God may pacify, protect, unify, and govern her. Holy Church has many battles to fight, and she needs this intercessory prayer during the ador adorable sacrifice. She continues the mission of Christ upon earth and must therefore be conformed to him in all things. As he was subjected to sorrows and persecutions all during the course of his life of 33 years, so the history of the life of the church down through the ages has been one of opposition and contradiction and of bloody persecution. You know, prayer and sacrifice made for the church benefits the whole world. And that's something that um, I think is um, kind of clear, I think, without going into anything else. You know, I remember there's a, if you've ever heard of a priest, his name is Father Zolsdorf, he, has, he quoted the phrase, save the liturgy, save the world. You know, from the liturgy, that heart and summit of our faith, the main source of grace for, for, from God for us, if you save it, you will save the world. When the church, when the world is falling apart, when the church falls apart, the, church, the world falls apart. And during those times when the church was unfaithful, you know, the church suffered just as much. And how very important it is for us to love the Mass and to love the liturgy. Prayer and sacrifice made for the church benefits the entire world. So then after that petition, as I said, prayer for the Pope, prayer for the Bishop, and then we go into what's called the commemoration of the living. And it is during that time that... Um, Many of us in our own devotion say that's a very efficacious time. You know, it is a very efficacious time in which the living, um, certain uh, persons that the priest wants to remember, the intention of the Mass, if it's offered for a living person, also all those whom he wishes to remember. And I, and I kind of laugh. I remember at the seminary we had a priest, older priest, uh, Father um, Zonarovich. He was a Blessed Sacrament Father, and he left them and joined the fraternity. I don't know what he did, but you know, it was just this very sort of brief... And then he continue on. I, mean, I think he had enough time just to mention the name of the person, and that was it. I always kind of laughed at that same thing with the, with the dead. I think it's a neglect for the priest not to spend time to remember specifically persons who he knows he has a responsibility to pray for, but those who have asked for prayers and those who need them. And for myself, my mementos tend to go on pretty long for anyone who's come to my masses. And that's certainly intent. I mean, I have to be reasonable. And the church does tell us we have to be reasonable you know, the first intention, if the Mass is offered for a living person, they are mentioned in the memento of the living, and then anyone else that the priest wishes to remember. So there's no time limit, but of course we have to be reasonable. And I, you know, for myself, the memento for the living and the memento for the dead are very important. You know, so if you ask me to pray for you, I certainly try to remember. Um, and it is during that time, what a great time, for the priest to intercede for himself and for the church. During that time, the canon, and just before the consecration at the Mass. How very powerful. And also it's a devotion that, um, you know, at the elevation of the host and the chalice, um, St. John Bosco often instructed his boys, at that time when the priest elevates the host and he elevates the chalice, that's the time that you should make a particular um, petition. And he often said that the prayer, that prayer would be granted. So... It's a good reminder for us. But also remember that during the memento of the living, the priest is praying for himself and for you, but also it's a good time for you to pray for yourself and to pray for those dear to you, those who need our prayers and those who have no one to pray for them, those who are in the greatest need of prayer. It is also your time to also petition and ask God for the same. The, the priest in his own role has that special, I suppose, uh, sort of a, not a power, but... I think that the prayers are much more efficacious during that time, but also it's your time to pray for yourself and for all those dear to you. Okay. It's 8 o'clock. 
Uh, let me let me just read this paragraph. Devout persons have at all times considered this memento at holy mass of great value. And how touching is the thought that in this memento the priest has the power to bring to God intentions and petitions, cares and sorrows from souls who perhaps have sought help and consolation everywhere else in vain, for whom no other hand or voice is raised but that of the priest at the altar. Who knows how many hopes are again revived by these few minutes at the altar. So many crosses and intentions have been confided to the, have been confided to the priest, sufferings of which he alone knows. For those and for all he sends up his prayer to heaven, reanimated by the hope that God will condescend graciously to grant these petitions in virtue of the holy sacrifice. So I'll end with that. Stand now, we'll end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Most sacred hearted Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. We'll see you next week.